What's up guys, UFC 300, I think it's completed, they announced the main event, three title fights, well realistically only two, and it's an amazing card, one of the most stacked pay-per-view cards in a very long time, it has 12 total fights, so there might be a couple more, maybe one or two, that will get announced, but the main event has been announced with Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill, revealed after UFC 298, Alex Pereira is trying to put another champion on his record, and the quickest championship turnaround in UFC history, we need more champions like Alex Pereira man, this guy is awesome and you can also be awesome with some factor the best online food delivery service deliver right to your doorstep all the prep already done for you you don't have to do any of the planning outside of just picking the meal that you want and factors gourmet chefs will have it all ready and done for you all you gotta do is just warm that up there's no waste of time on grocery shopping there's no waste of time on planning any kind of meal if you're working out or if you're on a diet or even just enjoying whatever meal you want is delivered to you to warm up and then ready to eat and they got so many different different meals on their menu they got spicy food if you like some of that they got calorie smart they got protein plus they got vegan i like to get a bunch of different stuff just to try it out and this time i got some spicy peanut grilled chicken which sounds really good i got some fennel and tomato grilled chicken which also sounds really good and three bean vegan chili so it's a little bit different of a mix and i think i'm gonna try the fennel and tomato grilled chicken ready to warm this up and then eat and they also have good beverages they have good smoothies as well many different flavors and factors giving you a deal as well you'll get 50 percent off your first factor order by going to factor75.com or click the link in the description below and use the promo code the weasel 50 again that's 50 percent off your first factor order by clicking the link in the description below and using the promo code the weasel 50 i'm telling you guys it's an amazing deal which is a great fight between two exciting fighters maybe not the best conditions for jamal hill over a year layoff going up against Alex Pearl, who's been quite active, and looking to become even more active because he's targeting to fight twice in 21 days. So I made a video months ago about him talking about this. I get more in detail of that, so if you guys want to check out that video, I'll leave it in the description below. And it seems like he's actually about it. Make the quickest turnaround in UFC championship history. He wants the main event UFC 300 against Jamal Hill, and then main event UFC 301 21 days later in Brazil. That would mean that he would have to come out of this fight with Jamal Hill rather unscathed. And the question is going to come up, is he overlooking Jamal Hill? Which would be a very bad mistake if he is. Or he's just that confident that he believes he can go right through Jamal Hill, knock him out into a Magomed Ankalaya fight three weeks afterward. I think it is doable, but highly unlikely given how dangerous that mission is. Jamal Hill is a dangerous striker looking to make a statement against Alex Pereira. And then Magomed Ankalaev has the wrestling, but also is a dangerous striker. It's such an unlikely task that if Alex Pereira pulls it off, I mean, he is literally doing the unthinkable. He became the fastest two-division champion in UFC history. And then if he breaks the championship turnaround record, I don't even know where you place this guy in, in an all-time list. Because what he's doing is just something no one's ever done before. And he's also trying to replicate his kickboxing career in MMA. Not only did he become a two-division champion in kickboxing, but he also made this quick turnaround in kickboxing as well. So he's trying to do the same thing in both sports. He is older, so he doesn't have a lot of time. So it's great to see him trying to be as active as possible and go after these records. Records. If he pulls this off, I mean, do they just allow him to go to the heavyweight division after and try to become the first three division champion in the UFC? The sky is the limit for Alex Pereira. He is becoming one of the most special fighters we've ever seen in all of combat sports. But he has this monster in front of him in Jamal Hill. I really wonder if Hill is going to try to take this fight to the ground or he's going to test the stand up with Pereira because he's been talking about that a lot. He believes that he is the guy that can outstrike Pereira in the light heavyweight division. And if I'm going to be honest, man, I don't think he does i think per actually knocks him out inside of two or three rounds I think Jamal Hill is going to be a little too hittable for Pereira style. He does extend his straights a bit too far and drops his hands when he throws his punches. A clean counter left hook from Pereira can catch him. And if he's staying from range, if he's not trying to throw and he's taking off those angles like he was showing against Glover Teixeira, who's a much slower opponent, right? Pereira's not going to be nearly as slow as Glover was. So it's going to be harder to take those angles on this guy. I think he's going to get his legs chopped up. And then it's going to force Jamal Hill to try to present some kind of offense forward with his hands and I think Pereira is going to counter him we also have to wonder how much ring rust is Jamal Hill going to have I think the smartest thing for Hill is try to test the wrestling or at least try to mix it up with his striking not turn this into a kickboxing fight he will get knocked out if he does so now Jamal Hill has never shot a takedown in his entire UFC career so we don't know where it stands we know he showed a really good takedown defense against Glover Teixeira who was a bit older he's not going to be as athletic or as fast on 
executing these takedowns as someone else would be, but you could kind of imagine maybe some of that defensive skills will translate to his offensive, but who really knows, right? And I can't imagine that he's a better grappler than Jan Blachowicz and maybe even Yuri Prohaska, but he could try to at least threaten with takedowns to open up striking opportunities. That is something that Jamal Hill should, I think, work with against Alex Pereira, not turn this into a traditional kickboxing fight with smaller gloves. But if it does turn into that, I do think Alex Pereira knocks him out. I think he catches him on a counter. Hill has way too many openings whenever he's offensive. And even at distance, he's going to take a lot of leg kicks. So my early prediction is I do think Alex Pereira gets it done and defeats yet another former champion in the UFC. That would be Sean Strickland first, who later became a champion. Israel Adesanya, who was the champ. Jan Blachowicz, who was a former champion. Yuri Prochaska, also a former champion. And Jamal Hill will be the fifth. The co-main event is Zhang Wei Li versus Yang Jianan, which was announced a long time ago. It's actually not going to be Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway. They're the third championship fight. So the co-main event is Wei Li versus Zhao Nan. I think Wei Li runs through Zhao Nan. I think Zhao Nan doesn't compete with Wei Li in almost any part of the game. She's a good fighter. Her strike has been progressing at a very rapid rate, but she steps behind Wei Li. I think Wei Li should be able to run through her on the stand-up. I think she should be able to out-wrestle her and out-grapple her once it gets to the ground. I'm imagining this is going to be a one-sided decision win for Zhang Wei Li. So my early prediction, I'm going with Wei Li big time. Then Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. This might be the best fight on the entire UFC 300 card. You guys see how big Max looks? Yo, Max is getting beefy, man. He is not looking like he was when he fought Dustin. He knows the mistakes he made preparing for Dustin Poirier, and this time he's going to correct all of it. He's looking like Justin Gaethje's size, which leads me to believe that not only he's going to be able to take a better punch, which is already crazy when you think about Max Holloway's chin already, but he might possess a lot more power. These two legends are going to go through a war, man. No BS, no drama, all respect between them two as they punch and kick each other in the leg, body, and face for five rounds. The carnage that these two are going to cause on each other and love every part of it is going to be some epic stuff, man. Max walks into and tanks a jab, starts throwing a five-strike combination, starting to the head, targeting the body, and then coming back up to the head as Justin's covering up, absorbing the barrage, but then fires back one or two huge punches is usually a right overhand and a left hook. Concussive blows every time Max engages, backing Max up for leg kicks, which will cause more devastating collisions as Max footwork starts to slow down. Every car crash will take a piece out of each other. But Justin's like driving a Dodge Ram, and Max is driving a Toyota Camry. Max can keep the mileage going and not slow down on activity, but Gaethje will win most of the exchanges that he lands with his punches. And I think at some point, Max will get dropped to a knee, but will keep coming, showing his heart, and I hope it doesn't end up like Tony Ferguson. But I think Justin might hurt Max more than anyone else did. I think Justin might get his hand raised at the end, all beaten up, lumps on his head, bruises on his body, definitely not coming out of this unscathed. Max is bigger, so I do expect him to have a lot more power, more sting behind those punches, and it's going to surprise a lot of fans when he starts hitting Justin Gaethje. But at the end, both fighters walk out from one of the greatest fights in recent memory. I think Max will move around a lot, use his footwork, kind of similar to what he did against Jeremy Stevens, who's the most powerful striker he's fought so far. And he didn't want anything to do with those collisions, man. He wasn't trying to meet Jeremy Stevens head on in these exchanges. But against Justin Gaethje, because of those leg kicks, he might have to. Or he could be so far away that he could try to bait out some of the leg kicks and then counter afterward. But the thing was, Max is taller and fought at a longer distance than Jeremy Stevens. Whereas with him and Gaethje, Gaethje's actually the longer guy, right? They're the same height. I know Gaethje has a wider wingspan. So at the end, I do expect Justin Gaethje to win this fight. And I think he's either going to win by a decision or like a fifth round TKO. And Max's chin might never be the same again. And then another amazing fight, Charles Oliveira versus Armin Saryukian, the last non-title fight on this card. And Dana said that the winner of this is going to fight Islam Makashev, and they're probably going to fight him in the summer. But that is only if these two guys do not come out damaged. And the way that Charles Oliveira fights... That barely ever happens for him. He got hurt in all of his recent fights besides when he fought Benil Dariush. And if you could do something similar against Armin Saryukin, like can you imagine if he comes out there with a first round knockout, head kicks Armin, KOing him, or if it doesn't, like he snatches the neck and it's over. Can you imagine something like that happening? I can. I honestly can. Armin doesn't have great defense. 
His offense is way better than his defense when it comes to his striking. Where he's very fast, he explodes for those overhands, he explodes for the right straight, the head kicks are a lot more dexterous than his punches are, but defensively, he kind of just moves away with his hands up. And Charles is a sniper, man. If you're moving away from him, he's going to pinpoint that one-two on you and potentially could find a front kick, an intercepting round kick to the head. And this is where Armin runs into an issue. Charles Oliveira is one of the only guys that Armin probably does not want to go to the ground with. And I have a feeling he's going to try to test it especially if he's getting overwhelmed in the stand-up. And that is the worst time to shoot on someone like Charles because it's much easier for you to fall into a choke. So the only thing that worries me for Charles Oliveira in this fight is if Armin explodes with something big and just catches Oliveira, you know, some big overhand, just some big punch or kick out of nowhere as Charles is being somewhat defenseless, which he is usually. He's getting better with his defense. His head is starting to move, but it's not at a level where he's completely defending himself at all times. He's still mostly defenseless, but I do ultimately pick him as an early prediction here. I think there's too much danger that comes with Oliveira, and Armin's defense overall, I don't think he's on the level to deal with someone like Oliveira right now, who's probably the most lethal offensive fighter in the UFC. And then I think that's going to set up that rematch between Islam and Oliveira. So we just talked about six champions. Now we're going to the seventh, Yuri Prohaska, going up against Alexander Rakic, who hasn't fought in two years. Rakic has not fought since he got injured against Jan Blachowicz, back in May of 2022, and Yuri Prohaska is coming off that loss to Alex Pereira, and he was also coming out of an injury before that fight, so he's trying to catch up on lost times, which I think is going to put him at an advantage, and he's been going up against, and he's been going up against the top competition, man. Yuri Prohaska has not had an easy fight ever since he came into the UFC, and is it crazy to think that Yuri only has four UFC fights? He only has four. He fought Volkan, then Reyes, then Glover, then Pereira. It seems like he's been in the UFC forever. And that might just be because how crazy his fights are. He's such a chaotic fighter. One fight seems like you watched three of them with how action-packed they are. And Rakic is the opposite fighter. He does much better when he's able to control the fight. It's a bit like chaos versus order in this fight. Here he's able to be effective anywhere the fight goes. Whether he's fighting on the back foot, whether he's pressuring you, whether he's, he's getting hit, whether he's hitting you, whether he goes to the ground, whether it's standing up, Yuri is always dangerous no matter where it goes. Whereas Rakic, it's harder for him to catch up when he's losing. And, we, and when he does feel like he's falling behind, he wants to clinch up with you, stall out the fight a little bit before he's able to download the data. But with Yuri Prohaska, he's one of the most unreadable fighters. Very unpredictable, but there are range issues that Yuri sometimes has throwing punches from way too far away and exposing himself, this is going to allow him to get countered. That happened in the Pereira fight. But the thing about Rakic is he's more of a kicker than he is a puncher. And if Yuri stays in his face, he should have the advantage almost the whole fight. He just does not want to get clinched up too often. But he has the elbows in there. He's very dangerous there as well. He just does not want to be standing too far away. Rakic's jab is very fast. He has a good one too. His leg kicks are super powerful. And we saw what Pereira was doing to Yuri's legs. Rakish doesn't have the same kind of technique that Pereira has, but look at the size of that guy's legs, man. Look what he did to Anthony Smith's legs. So Yuri definitely does not want to be standing too far away. He wants to be close at all times. And the more offensive he is, I think the more success he's going to have, including the two-year hiatus. For my early prediction, I am definitely going to go with Yuri Prohaska. And I think he's going to be potentially one fight away from getting a title shot again. Then we go to another champion, Aljamain Sterling, for his first time in the UFC, goes up to the featherweight division, taking on Kelvin Cater, who's, you could say, essentially a gatekeeper of the featherweight division. Good fighter, has good boxing, developing his grappling, throwing more kicks, better kicking defense now, and he's going to be the much bigger fighter in there. Kelvin is one of the biggest featherweights on the roster, which is going to present a very difficult debut for Sterling. Just that in itself, right? He's a guy who outsized most of the bantamweights, and he's going up to featherweight and finally going up against someone who's much bigger than he is. Not only is he 5'11", as was Sean O'Malley, but he's full and very wide for a featherweight as well. Kelvin Cater has been getting better on the back foot, but he's still not all there with it. And just like Alexander Rakic, he has not fought since 2022 but in October, so it's about a year and a half since he got injured against Arnold Allen, and he's 1-3 in three in his last four fights. He desperately needs a win here, and he might be ring-rusted, which is not good conditions for him to go into this fight with Aljamain Sterling, who's going to be a bit more active. He fought twice since Kelvin Cater fought, and he needs to put the pressure on Cater. Constant pressure, man. He has to fight this almost how he fought Pietro Jan the second time, with a lot of volume going forward, and just but attacking with the single leg more specifically, given Kelvin Cater's size. And when Cater's in a perpetual backward motion, his hands are very inactive. He doesn't throw too much. He throws a lot more when he's moving forward. When he's moving back, not so much, and I think Aljamain is going to be able to exploit something like this because he does his best work when he's overwhelming you. I don't know if he's going to get Cater to the ground because regardless if Cater 
is an act of going backwards, he is eventually going to throw something, right? He did it even against Max Holloway, who was putting a ton of pressure on him. And we know that Cater has a lot of power in that right hand. And Sterling, so if the fight stays standing, I think Cater will eventually catch him with something big and start winning because of damage and start winning on the scorecards because of damage. But if Elgerman could get the fight to the ground, grab onto the back as Cater's trying to explode and stand right back up, I think Elgerman will start winning this round. So my early prediction, it's very hard for me to pick. I have a gut feeling that Cater is going to win this, but my head is telling me Elgermain. So I'm going to go with Elgermain Sterling. Also a big reason because Cater might be a little bit ring rusted and he is 35 years old, which makes that probability even higher. And then we're going to Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. I mean, come on. You know, this is like the only fight on the card that's very easy to pick, I think. Bo Nickel just runs right through Cody Brundage, I think. It's another alley-oop for Bo Nickel. Then we're going to two former champions fighting each other. Davis and Figueredo going up against Cody Garbrandt rip Cody's chin. If he gets touched by the right hand of Davison, this fight is over. But Cody's fast still. He'll throw some slick moves out there sometimes. He will attack takedowns more than ever before. And he must know that Davison had an issue defending the trips and the clinch against Brennan Moreno. Maybe he tackles this with a wrestling approach and doesn't entertain the back and forth exchanges in the stand-up. Because if he does that, he's probably getting KO'd. He will sometimes throw Reckless, which will deliver with that kind of power, and he's very, very fast with his hands. But the thing is, Davison has like three times the chin that Cody does. I wouldn't even be surprised if Davison got him with a really good jab and Cody starts doing the chicken dance, which leads me to believe that Davison is going to win this fight. I am expecting Davison to win by knockout, probably first or second round. But I will say, Cody's still dangerous, man. Can't completely rule him out because Davison sometimes will walk into punches. He's done that many times as he's so confident in his chin. Then we go to two other former champions, one in the UFC, one from PFL. Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. This could have turned into a Holly Holm versus Ronda Rousey 2 scenario, but Holly is 42 years old and Kayla Harrison is 33. You could even say her prime maybe, or at least toward the end of it. She is much bigger than Holm is. She used to fight at 155. I cannot imagine that she's going to make that weight cut, whereas Kayla Harrison's walk around weight is 165. I don't even know how she's going to make 135. I don't know how she's going to make 135. That's going to be an extremely tough weight cut for her. It also could be a detriment to her chances to beat someone like Holly Holm. I honestly have no idea what to expect from this fight, given Holly Holm's age and given Kayla Harrison never fighting at 135 before. I believe she only fought at featherweight 145 one time in her career, and every other fight was 155 or 150. But if they're able to get in there and they're both healthy and, you know, as good as they can be at their age, I have a feeling Kayla Harrison is going to clinch up with her as Holly Holmes' game plan these days has been more about clinching than striking. You know, when she fought Ronda Rousey, she was completely against clinching up with Ronda and now that's all she does. And you can look at Kayla Harrison as generally a bigger, stronger version of Ronda Rousey with the knowledge of how Holly Holm fought Ronda before. Right, she knows how Holly Holm's going to fight someone with a judo background and not good distance management. Kayla's not going to be as reckless as Ronda was. I think she's going to pick her shots better. I think she's going to cut off the cage better, clinch up with Holly Holm, dump her on her head, and just start dominating on top. If the fight gets to the ground, I think Holly Holm is going to be in a lot of trouble. Not only does Kayla have a similar style to Ronda Rousey, she is way better than Ronda when it comes to judo. It's not even close. Holm was able to get up from the bottom when Ronda got her down. I don't think she does the same against Kayla Harrison. So I'm going to go with a younger Kayla Harrison by a second or third round submission. And then after this, Kayla Harrison is probably going to fight for the belt. That seems to be the plan for Kayla Harrison. Like, capitalize on her Olympic career, start promoting her as the next Ronda Rousey, you know, something like that. You know, at least relating her somewhat to Ronda. I think it's somewhat of the business move that the UFC is going to do. And the reason why they have Holly Holm on this 300 card is for the fact that so many people know her, right? A lot of the casual fans know who that is. And, th and then when you hear another judoka who's an Olympic gold medalist, not a bronze like Ronda was, right, two-time Olympic gold medalist, going up against Holly Holm and avenging judo in a sense, you know, I think the UFC wants Kayla Harrison to beat Holly Holm for that reason, so they can start promoting the next star of the bantamweight division, because right now there's not anybody. Kayla Harrison has the biggest star quality out of any 135er right now. Then we're going to Sadiq Yusuf versus Diego Lopez. So Bo Nickel and Diego Lopez are the good prospects of this card. And Diego Lopez, I mean, it's crazy the rise he's had so far. I mean, he's had a long MMA career so far, but in the UFC, he just got started, man. And people love this guy. And it all started by chance. He took up a fight on short notice against Mavsar Evloev, who is one of the higher ranked featherweights right now, and nearly beat that guy. And ever since that, two first round finishes, both performance of the night. And he's going up against another ranked contender. Sadiq Yusuf is number 13. He was at one point considered one of the better prospects of the featherweight division. But now after two losses to ranked fighters, Arnold Allen and Edson Barboza, the perspective of Sadiq Yusuf as some 
sort of rising prospect has been transitioned and put onto Diego Lopez. Diego Lopez seems to be the guy that the UFC now wants to build up for that weight class. And man, this is going to be a test for him. Sadiq is a good fighter. He's fought some really good guys. He has dangerous boxing, really good hands, very fast counters, and sometimes throws them in tight as Diego Lopez will extend with those combos at long range and throw some wild punches out there. And he might get caught coming in for that. But Diego's a big guy who hits very hard and extremely dangerous jiu-jitsu skills. And Yusuf has okay takedown defense. I mean, I'm not going to look too much at Edson Barboza taking him down because Sadiq was gassed in that fifth round and he was already hurt. I don't think it's a good example of how good his takedown defense is when he's fresh. But then again, he also got taken down by Alex Caceres and Andre Feely. We haven't seen Diego really shoot many takedowns yet. Right, I think he's only shot one in his UFC career. He kind of overwhelms the opponent, scrambles his way to the ground, or he gets so overwhelming that he forces his opponent to take him down. I really wonder where his offensive wrestling skills are at. If he has a good double leg and you know causes enough chaos in the stand-up to get Sadiq Yusuf off balance and then shoots and takes him to the ground, I think Sadiq Yusuf is going to be in a lot of trouble. But I have a feeling that Sadiq Yusuf is going to derail this hype train. I think his counterpunching skills in a three-round fight especially are going to be sharp. Diego does expose himself a lot. He's extremely reckless with what he throws. Just the only thing is he's big, long, and powerful. But I like Sadiq being as precise and as composed as he is. So I'm going to go with Sadiq Yusuf as an early prediction, even though I really like Diego Lopez. I just think Sadiq is going to shut him down in this one. And I think he's going to win this fight through a decision. But Diego's definitely going to have moments. I don't think there's any fight where Diego doesn't have moments. I think he's just way too dangerous to be an easy fight for anybody. Then we're going to Jessica Andrade, another former champion on the card, versus Marina Rodriguez. So this is your 12th UFC champion on the card. And I think this is one of the best female fights you can put on. Two of the most exciting female fighters on the roster barely have any boring fights. Aggression is both of their games, but they but they attack in different ways. Andrade is the brute. Doesn't have too much technique, but she overwhelms you with her power and cardio. She's lost a bit of her chin over the years, which was going to happen to her. She's fought for such a long time, been through so many wars, fought at 135, 125, and 115. I wouldn't be surprised if she gets chinned by Marina Rodriguez. And Jessica Andrade is 1-3 in, in her last four fights. Her last win was against Mackenzie Dern. And we know the way McKenzie fought in that one. Marina Rodriguez has a very sharp Muay Thai style that attacks from range with a lot of output, man. Some of her game reminds me of Joanna. And that is going to be a difficult fight for Jessica Andrade, I think. I think Marina's jab is going to be on point the whole time. She's going to land some head kicks. Andrade always gets hit by the power shots. And I think in this one, she's not going to be able to take all of them. I think with the amount of right straights, right uppercuts, and right high kicks that Rodriguez puts on Andrade's head is going to put her down for a TKO. So I'm going to go with Marina Rodriguez by a second round TKO as Andrade's chin has been cracked. And because of that, she doesn't have the technical defense to handle anybody with that kind of striking skill. From before, the reason that she was able to get by and not get knocked out was because she had that chin, not because of her technique. Remember all the shots that Rose hit her with? Yoana head kicking her, Shevchenko with the one twos, all the right hands that Claudia hit her with. The reason why she wasn't able to get knocked out in those fights was because she had the chin. But now that she's lost it, I think Rodriguez is going to put her down. And then finally, the last fight we're going to talk about, but the first fight on that card is Bobby Green versus Jim Miller. Jim Miller is the veteran of the UFC. No one's had more fights than him. No one's had more wins than him. He was at UFC 100, UFC 200. And he's officially on UFC 300 against the perfect kind of opponent, but maybe not under the perfect circumstances because Bobby Green got knocked out horribly against Jalen Turner in his last fight. And that wasn't that long ago. One of the worst late stoppages we've ever seen in the sport. And that was back in December. I cannot imagine at Bobby Green's 37-year-old age with 48 professional fights. I can't imagine he takes a big shot from Jim Miller. And Jim Miller's been cracking these young guys in the chin and putting them down. He is more powerful than I've ever seen him. And one of the only old guys in the sport that's aged pretty well. I mean, he's not fighting the best guys anymore. Against the young fighters coming up, you would expect them to put a bit more of a challenge against them, but they just don't. Jim Miller is that guy. You know, everyone has that uncle that just talks about how tough he used to be back in the day, you know, right? Jim Miller reminds me of that, that real uncle that's going to be talking about his fight stories. And I think he's going to catch Bobby Green at some point in this fight. Bobby Green has good technique. He has better boxing overall than Jim Miller. He has decent takedown defense. But I think one big shot from Jim Miller is going to rock him. And from there, I think Jim Miller could take him right to the ground and submit him. So I'm going to go with Jim Miller getting another win. I don't even know if it's going to be his last fight, though. Does Jim Miller keep going? I don't know if he talked about it. But regardless, Jim Miller is going to be in the Hall of Fame, deservingly so. And if he pulls off a win, man, that roof is going to be blown off the place. So that's UFC 300, guys. Really, really good card. It is incredibly stacked. We got 12 
UFC champions. And I think that's a record for the UFC. I don't think there's ever been a UFC card with this many champions on it. So leave in the comments below what you guys think about UFC 300, what are your favorite fights, and who you think are going to win these fights. Make sure to give the video a like, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and I'll see you guys in the next video.